Charles Moskowitz, I believe I'm pronunciating uh, pronunciating correctly there. Uh, yes. Well, welcome to the Kill Stream, sir. I appreciate you being here. It's your first appearance. Thank you. Pleasure. It's an honor. Well, thank you. Wow, I appreciate you saying that. Um, now, um, I ask a lot of guests this, most of them, especially on their first appearance, uh, to just give a rundown of their career and what it is that got them on the show and what it is they do as far as, you know, some of them are in entertainment or activism or writer like yourself, uh, and you do content as well. Um, but what's your background? Well, for the past 20 odd years, off and on, I've done talk radio and radio sales at various stations in my own hometown of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I started getting involved in writing mainly as a prompt from a regular guest of mine, the late Dr. Samuel Blumenfeld, who um, uh, amazing uh, author, uh, education thinker. And uh, I started by writing short blogs eventually, which expanded into essays which eventually expanded into books. And since then, I'm really hooked on writing books. I write an average of two to three a year. Um, as far as the uh, radio show, I made a comeback sort of by doing an online show. And um, I do a live stream, I do commentary, I have guests, I do sort of what you guys are doing. And it's, uh, yeah, it's amazing, I mean, what you can do. I mean, really with just a laptop. I mean, anybody can knock a few ideas over the plate and um, be heard and and have influence now even with the censorship and all of the banning we are still uh you know making it happen and it's a great thing well you know it's it's um that made me think of uh when i was talking to you in twitter dms and he said well, you were banned from uh youtube and i was like well i am too <laughs> actually so um yeah. i understand how that goes what did you get banned for well you know how with twitter it's hard to know i mean they uh eventually they went through all of my archives and i had probably about 600 videos up there and they just i mean there was no way i was going to go into all of my own archives and try to figure out something i might have said that ran afoul of the censorship i just I, I just didn't have the stomach to do that so i just they they went through it they found things and they dropped the show it's hard to know what i think that there you and i think that there are certain taboo subjects um frankly one of them is issues around anti-semitism and judaism but um but there's also the any discussion of the pandemic is kind of a foreboding if you know if you want to follow of the uh who and and the powers that be over there and um any discussion about the 2020 election is a no-no discussions about the uh, events of january 6th at the u.s capitol is a no-no um, you know, the usual things that are just forbidden on YouTube. And I may note that they are not forbidden on terrestrial radio. Um, you know, here in Boston, uh, Jeff Kooner talks about all of these things, and he does so great, brilliantly. I was on regular radio for years, so I understand FCC regulations, and I always work within them. I might have pushed the envelope a bit here and there, but never a problem. It's really the online um, venue that that is censoring and and that includes obviously youtube and and the, and the rest of them um so uh, in spite of that i think that uh i i my main channel is rumble i'm on uh, rockfin i'm on a bunch of channels and i have been able to continue doing what i'm doing and uh, do it without fear so i'm grateful for that you know what i'm glad you made that i don't think we've actually had that discussion on the air before um the delineation there between terrestrial radio, uh, television even, uh, mm -hmm. and the internet. And why do you think that is, that, the, that they, they censor the people on the internet? I mean, I have my own theory that uh, there's no gatekeepers really here on the internet, um, but to get on TV, to get on the radio, there are, <laughs> there are gatekeepers um, there. Is, yeah. um, but they're able to more freely discuss certain topics um, than you, than, than, people like me and you are on YouTube and Twitter's loosened up a lot recently, but, um, yep. even there you can still get, you can still get clipped, uh, here and there, but for sure on Facebook and Instagram and all the others, um, you know, good luck to you. Why do you think that is the, the, that delineation? Why does it, does it, well, does I think that radio talk radio is kind of grandfathered in. I mean, Rush Limbaugh was a pioneer. The, uh, you know, it's been around and it's a little more difficult to, completely censor it, although there is some of that. Regarding the uh, the, the, the big tech um, online, 
my understanding, and I don't know a lot about it, but I believe that there were meetings held after the election of, of Donald Trump, which was not supposed to happen, and which really shocked them and kind of went against all of their algorithms and everything else they're doing. And they really decided to try to not outright censor, but to reduce the influence of people that had run afoul of the establishment. Now, in some cases, maybe there were people who were doing things like inciting violence or you know the kind of stuff that is not allowed on the FCC. There are some reasonable dimensions, but they really got into po uh, political opinion. And it, it, in that sense, it's very un-American. I mean, it, it sort of edited out whatever hit the algorithm, certain code words that that would send up a red flag and then they would they would censor or they would reduce and in my case we move and 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 me and thousands of other people including donald trump himself all removed uh all censored but they did not expect alternative media to pick up the slack and that's what's happened there's rumble there's getter there's gab there's uh rockfin there's all these other amazing sites no they're not as good as youtube but they are building and people are, are still able to develop enough of, a, of an influence that, that they are able to conduct responsible and solid conversations. Uh, I think you, I agree with everything you just said there. And when they, they can censor, Trump was still the president when they, when they start censoring. When they can do that, I mean, there's, there's no boundary really they can't cross uh, as far right. as censorship. Um, it's a, a little dismaying, I guess. Uh, it's kind of a long-term topic here on the show, but I've never really had it talked about like that, how you can still talk about these topics on the radio, uh, mm. but on YouTube you cannot, uh, and that's, that's sad to say, really. Um, now, you have your book behind you, and I, I looked through, you write, you've written a lot, quite a few, like you yes. said, and so, but this is your latest book, I think. Um, the anti-Semitic imagination, and it, it piqued my interest uh, reading the, I don't know if you call it an abstract, but um, the, the promo text there, kind of the abstract, um, uh, on Amazon. But why don't you tell us about the book a little bit? Sure. Well, look, as a Jew, I'm concerned about um, mischaracterizations of my faith and, and, uh, and my people. And yet, at the same time, as someone who analyzes conspiracy, I think there's a lot of validity to some of the theories. The, the issue I take with it is that it is not a Jewish conspiracy that we're talking about. The Jews as individuals and even Jewish groups have played a, a role in these conspiracies, but not as Jewish per se. It's more because they were corrupted by certain Ill, Ill elements that wormed their way into the Jewish fabric. And I get into that in my book. But Judaism itself is the exact opposite of this sort of globalist, internationalist, controlling, amoral, um, occultic, illuminated establishment. It stands for individualism. It stands for, you know, family values, education, you know, picking yourself up, freedom, all of these things, belief in God, ultimately. And... Uh, and yet Judaism, like Christianity, like many other faiths, there's been some corruption that's worked its way into the fabric. I just don't think that it's, I think it's a diversion to say, well, Judaism is to blame, or that Judaism is all the, the, the very center of this conspiracy when it's not. Now, in the in the text that I read, I didn't read the whole the whole book. To be clear, I just kind of went through your your record a little bit, um, yeah. and I wish I could did have time to read the whole book uh, before you came on. But uh, I wouldn't be against that actually, because um, mm -hmm. it like I said, it kind of piqued my interest. Um, and again, we have an audience here um, who probably doubting some of the stuff you're saying. Uh, some of them <laughs> in the audience. Um, Maybe expound upon a little bit more specifically um, this part that um, uh, theorizing that anti-Semitism has been weaponized by elements of the establishments. What what did you mean by that? Well, well, I, I kind of break it down into two types of anti-Semitism: the normal type and the weaponized type. The normal type is simply, uh, you know, old-fashioned prejudice. I'm not here to excuse that. A lot of it's based on fear and ignorance and. And there's also envy as part of it. We imagine that the Jewish guy down the street is richer than we are, he may be, or has more than we have, he has a better house than we have, better car, better looking wife, who knows? 
The point is that we, you know, envy is is one of the seven deadly sins. And we all have a certain amount of envy for people that we imagine have more than we have. Uh, so that's a normal sort of reaction. And also the Jew is the minority. The Jew is the, the so-called other. And we always have a suspicion of anyone who is outside of the mainstream in that sense, someone who's deviating from the, the majority. And that's normal. We all have that. That's part of human nature. Where it becomes abnormal and weaponized is when you have governments, you have institutions, you have powerful people who will basically put these qualities on the Jews. They will use, the, they will blame the Jews for what it is they're doing. They will, the Jew becomes the scapegoat. The Jew becomes the shiny object. It's very easy to look at the Jew and say, oh, the Jews are behind this. When we see things going on in society that is disturbing, we see inflation, for example. It costs 15 bucks to get a McDonald's hamburger, you know, for now. I mean, what is going on? It must be the Jews, the bankers, you know, the, the Jews are running the currency. We see these weird social events, like 30% of our young people now identify as non-binary. When did that happen? I mean, I hadn't heard of this maybe five or six years ago. No one had ever heard of it. All of a sudden, it must be the you know a Jewish conspiracy to corrupt the world. Uh, you can name any other subject, open borders, right? People, over 3 million people rushing over the border. Well, I mean, Mallorcas, he's a Jew, you know, right? And the Jews are behind this because they, so that's a, a weaponizing of anti-Semitism as a way to distract from the real problem, which is much bigger than, than anything to do with Judaism. It's, you know, yeah, there are Jews involved and the Jews are part of this informal conspiracy and i do use that word um but it's not but judaism itself is not the source and and the people that are involved who are jewish at least in background are generally not you know representative of judaism and they're not really if they claim to be they're not the better members of the tribe they're jewish i'm not backing away from that but they're not acting as jews you know i mean uh Merrick Garland is not acting as a Jew when he uh, authorizes the FBI to spy on parents at school board meetings. He's operating more as an authoritarian and is probably a leftist. But to say that it's a Jewish issue is missing the point, and it's wrong. Now, okay, so why do you think that um, they're just scapegoating Jews so they can hold this out there and then do an end around? Is that what you're saying with, with what their real yeah. agenda is? What's the real agenda yeah. then? I think the real agenda is a, a hermetically sealed, controlled world by a, a clique of elitists who think that they are smarter than the rest of us. And it's the same, you know, this idea of replacing God with man, with rule by man. Whitaker Chambers, the great American uh, author and communist back in the 1930s who exposed the communist conspiracy as it had wormed its way into the FDR administration. He uh, wrote a book called Witness after the trial of the century between Chambers and Alger Hiss, who was Assistant Secretary of State, in which he talked about the world's second oldest religion. He used as a metaphor Adam and Eve, and he points out that in the garden, Eve was tempted by the serpent, which represents Satan, as saying, you can be like God, you can know all things. You can know every you know, good and evil. You can have complete dominance over all that is real. But all you have to do is take partake of this forbidden fruit. But in other words, what the serpent was saying to Eve was you can be as God. You can replace God. And ever since then, once they took advantage of the fruit, every generation has had a clique of people who see themselves as replacing God, as being dominant over the world. They want to replace God with the rule by them. They claim to have some kind of an enlightened inner power. They set up secret societies so they can conduct this business out of the sight of average people because <clears throat> if they did it up front, nobody would accept it. And they believe that they have some kind of a divine right to reduce and overthrow God, create their own universe on earth, define what is real, to find what is true. And it's a conspiracy in the in the informal sense. Whitaker Chambers made reference to 
a conspiracy of gentlemen. And that's what it is. It's not necessarily a bunch of guys sitting around a smoke-filled room. It's more of a mindset. And that mindset is one by which these so-called enlightened people have a right to control the rest of us. And they have tools that they can use to reduce our agency and our power, which is that we are created in the image of God and that we are under God as expressed in our own constitution and our declaration of independence. All right. Now uh, I see the audience here. If you have any questions, super chat, you know, all the options there. I won't run them all down uh, right now, but um, we're going to delve into this a little bit now. I can see some of the chat, uh, not, not agreeing. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah, no, uh, I can handle it. I, yeah, no, no, I know you can handle it. I already knew. I already knew. You knew what you're getting into. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I didn't take you. Let's for, have it. Let's have at yeah. it. Yeah, I didn't take you for. I didn't take you for a fool. Uh, yeah. I, I, I knew you knew what what would be the reception. Oh yeah, no, I know what I mean. Um, yeah. Now I, I could imagine one of them saying, "Well, um, one of them might say, well, the Jews control the media.' That's a that's a of frequent refrain. First off, do you agree with that? Uh, and then second off. If you do agree with it, if you don't, uh, well, first off, do you agree with that, I guess? I suppose in the literal sense, yes. Jews are very influential in the media. We've always been very able to communicate well. We're, we're ambitious. Jews are very successful in a lot of ways, and the media is one of them. Um, I only note that they're not controlling it as Jews. They're controlling it as liberals and leftists. And liberalism has become dominant within Judaism that control can be both good and bad and that the jew as a person because of perhaps our training because of our ancestry even we're very intense i mean jews have been walking with god for centuries for millennia and that intensity and that mission can be employed for either the good or the bad and that uh, you know people are not wrong to say the jews control the media but there's no you know they're not doing it for a jewish agenda they're doing it for a leftist world globalist agenda that is not jewish and it's actually anti-jewish that's my main point here um and and that the main focus is not whether someone is has a jewish background or a christian background whether they observe the sabbath on a saturday or a sunday the issue is whether or not they are trying to move the world move society in the direction of this world control or or are they not and and in a sense that's that's really the focus all right so you you're saying they do control the media um but that they're not doing it for the benefit of of judaism proper um or even jewish right. people uh that they're doing it for the benefit of leftists and the leftist agenda Correct, and and that I wouldn't say they outright control the media. Well, right. I would, I would but, say but that there are look, a lot of high level yeah, people yeah. in the media who are Jewish. Yeah, you could see why somebody might be like, "Well, yeah. you, they're running this thing, right?" Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, all right. Well, let me pivot off that, and we'll probably come back to it maybe here in a second. But um, it, it made me think of, of what's going on in Gaza and and Israel. Uh, the media, we were just watching some coverage on that today, and there was a big breakdown in the UK Parliament over this. I don't know if you saw that, but they had a meltdown right. over the ceasefire vote over there. Um, how do you, first off, I guess your thoughts on the whole situation, uh, because I don't think we can really talk about this without talking about um, uh, Israel and, and APAC and, and their influence over foreign policy and why somebody might think, well, you know, this is a, a Zionist thing here. Um, and they're, they're pushing for more wars, uh, speculation over 9-11. We've had some people on here who don't accept that, that mm -hmm. official story. Um, we've, you know, people, the neocon project itself was mostly a Jewish um Oh, Jews were involved. Let's just put it that way. A lot of leading right. think thinkers, Irving Crystal, um, Bill Crystal, and uh, Pod Harrod's family, and all these people. Well, they're all they're all Jewish, um, but not all. Not every single neocon. But well, you know, Richard Pearl. Just, a lot of these people. Are, yeah, but I could just interrupt and also say sure. that it was kind of if we must look at ethnicity and religion, you might say it was a partnership between. And this is this goes back to between Jews and the white Anglo-Saxon establishment as represented by the Rockefellers, the Bushes, 
the Harrimans, the Brown brothers, you know, the uh, J.T. Morgan and, and all of those people. The Jews have played kind of a junior partner with that. And that's something that I get into in my book also, the history of that weird partnership. I give Catholics, by the way, a big break here because I don't think, <laughs> I think they've always been against this in general. I mean, they have their people too, but Catholicism has always stood as a strong bulwark in opposition. It's never been infiltrated by this elitist, um, amoral establishment. Maybe, unfortunately, recently it may have been, I hope not, but uh, Judaism has been compromised to a large degree. And you do have these people who are part of this world order involved in this perpetual war for perpetual peace, as, um, as, as, as American historian Charles Austin Beard called it after World War I. And that's unfortunately been this internationalist agenda. Uh, I think that it's the primary focus of it and the beginning of it is this Anglo-American establishment that was written about by Carol Quigley in his book, Tragedy and Hope. And it was really the Rhodes Roundtable groups, the, uh, you know, these kind of, that set up the Council on Foreign Relations in New York and the uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs in London. And these are high level, predominantly WASP people, predominantly white people who want to control the world informally. They don't want to have absolute open control. It's more uh, the ability to control through controlling the cultural institutions, controlling the central banks, the investment vehicles. Now, as far as Zionism goes, this is probably the one thing that I could say is part of a Jewish agenda, other than maybe the far extreme left and the far extreme right within Judaism, Jews are Zionists, and they have come together after the horrible attack of August the, of uh, October the 6th in Israel. They are supporters of the nation state of Israel. It's a nationalist movement. It's a movement that should inspire all of us who are nationalists. It should inspire American nationalists. It should inspire the nationalists of all nations because it is that. It's, it's, it's basically a very simple proposition. And that is that Israel is that tiny speck of land, that little piece of beachfront really, that exists between the Jordan River and the Great Sea, the Mediterranean. That is, it's also a religious movement. That is the land that the Lord God, King of the universe, told the ancient Israelites that they were to take possession of. Now, why did God say that? I have no idea. But that's what he says in the Torah. It is throughout the Torah, which is the Old Testament for Christians. And it's just that it's nothing more and nothing less. It's not world control. It's not conquest of any other nation. It is simply that the Jewish people, the children of Israel, are commanded to reside in that land, control that tiny land as a way to develop a moral co a co a commonwealth that will be a light unto the world. It's that simple. So it's both a religious and national movement, nothing more and nothing less. As far as the war goes, look, the Israelis, they have always known how to play this international game. There's no question about that. And they've done some things in partnership with the internationalists that are unsavory. And I'm not going to try to apologize for it, other than to say that the ultimate motivation for the Jews, and they can be wrong in their approach, is to preserve the sovereignty of that tiny nation state, nothing more and nothing less. Now, you can see how somebody might say, well, you know, and I've had guests on this show, even some people you might not expect, um, cite Israel actually as a, hey, this is a good example of, of nationalists, right? Like you should look at their model and we should adopt some of their style, right? Uh, right. And adopt some of their tactics maybe even here and there um, to push our own nationalist agenda in America or another, um, you know, majority white country or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But you can see how somebody might say, well, fair enough, you know, they're nationalists, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, their foreign policy influence uh, in the United States has pushed us into uh, Iraq. Uh, it's pushed us into uh, being the policeman over there. It's pushed us into, okay, we have to veto this at the UN. We have to do that. Um, you know, c controlling basically all of Congress. Um, 
and you know you have you have a person like Nikki Haley saying, <laughs> which is still one of the craziest comments to me, said America doesn't need or uh, what is it? Israel doesn't need America, but America needs Israel and 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 stuff that's just right. like wow, like what you're running for president of the United States? Like that's a wild statement to say one of our allies we need them more than they need us. That's just uh, it's putting America down basically, right? Um, yeah. And and there's a lot of other uh, I guess uh, things there, but. What do you what do you think about their influence? Is that is that part of the internationalists? You know, they're just falling in with mm -hmm. them to to you know preserve Israel. Is is that what you're saying here? Or right. um, you know, these are frequent topics on on our show. No, guess, no, they well, are. Is, is why I bring that up. Um, oh no, glad you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Well, well, first of all, the the Israelis will say, "Well, we're the only democracy, and we're totally invaluable to the United States," and that's bull crap. They're yeah. not. They're not right about that. And I would just to give a little background, when Israel was ready to declare its independence in 1948, the entire establishment was against it. The Council on Foreign Relations was against it. Secretary of State Marshall was against it. Secretary of Defense Forrestal was against it. And the reasons they were against it were very practical. They're like, why the hell should we support this miserable little country? They've got no land, they've got no money, they've got no oil. They've got, you know, it's nothing but a group of Holocaust survivors. I mean, who cares? While we have the, you know, we should be currying favor with the Arab and Islamic world with their vast populations and their oil and their wealth. And they stretch all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It's a huge area. So it was a very practical geopolitical consideration. But the fact is that, that Harry Truman went ahead and recognized Israel anyway. And it's an interesting story. I get into that in my book. I know some people who are conspiracy minded say that he was bribed. I don't know if that's true or not. If he was, it was money well spent. That's what I was going to say. That's exactly <laughs> what I was just thinking. That was one of the best bribes in history, if that's the case, because yeah. you're exactly correct. He went against all advice. Uh, and he basically, did. just uh, everybody was like, no, don't do this. What? And then he went he's ahead like, I'm the president, I'll do what I want. Yeah. Yeah. Go. yeah he went ahead. And then, and about a, a week later, the president of the new country of Israel, Chaim Weitzman, shows up at the White House and gives him a Torah as a gift. And he says to him, your mother, you were put in the womb of your mother so that you would grow up and, and recognize Israel. You're like Cyrus from the, from the Bible, who uh, his charter to the Israelis at that time, the Judeans, was go back to your country, rebuild your temple, rebuild your society. And he's called a Messiah in the Bible, by the way. And, uh, and Truman, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. I mean, it was a very emotional meeting. What I would say is that Israel is not supported because of APAC or, or the Israeli lobby, although they certainly do what they have to do. It is supported because the vast majority of the American people support it, not because of the establishment. The establishment doesn't give a crap about Israel. They hate Israel, if you really get down to it. It's supported because liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants, the majority have always in this country supported Israel's right to exist as a sovereign Jewish state. There are political reasons for that because we as Americans, going back to our own war of independence, we support the right of people to have sovereign states and to have that gift and to be able to control their own lives and their own destiny. But it also has a religious component as well. The fact that Israel is a Jewish state is predicted both amongst Christians and Muslims, I may add, as being the setting the stage for the coming of the Messianic age. That's something that all of the three Abrahamic faiths share. So it's a complicated question. I would only note that the establishment it, it, you know, is not pro-Israel. Israel is supported because the American people, the American voters, the American individuals under God, the majority has always supported Israel. And that's why they get, they get support now. Okay. There's a lot of different ways I could take that, but you, you mentioned that and I, I've seen some polling, which is, uh, I don't necessarily quibble with that, uh, honestly, um, because I think traditionally that has been true. I don't know if they, I don't know if Gallup was the only polling around, I think back during Truman's days and just getting started. I don't know if there was a poll, uh, stretching right. back that far, but traditionally, yeah, that's true. Um, now one might say as a counter, well, they control Hollywood. They control uh, a lot of the stuff you see on television uh, and stuff like that. But there is a religious component too, and and I think you're you're right to cite that. Um, 
But do you see that continuing? Uh, because I've seen some polling from the, what is it, Generation Z or Z? Some of it's Generation Z, but it's some of it's Generation yeah. Alpha or whatever, the, the one after, um, where you see there's a drastically different uh, view on what's going on in Gaza uh, and our t support of Israel and the handling of the conflict, uh, where you see younger people, younger people than me, I, I'm 38, I'm not young anymore, uh, and you know, you see uh, polling from 17 to 34 or whatever, 17 to 30, uh, where it's kind of uh, flipped around uh, a little bit. Uh, now, will they stay that way or will they drift? Who knows, you know, they're young people, right? Um, but do you see that holding, particularly um, with some of the, I guess, some of the conduct of the war, right? You know, they're arguing about a right. ceasefire in the UK. We talked about that earlier. Biden himself mm -hmm. even is trying to pivot, at least in public, uh, to, you know, chastising Israel a little bit. Uh, well, you know, in private, it's not really like that. But, uh, you know, he's yeah. trying to change his image a little bit. Um, do you see that that holding uh, as we go into yes. the decades? I do see it holding, but it is there has been some erosion. You're absolutely right among younger people. I think that a lot of that is the influence of the radical left, which hates Israel for two reasons, I would note. The first is because Israel is capitalist. Israel, you know, in the imperfect sense, capitalism is no utopia, but Israel is a country that has a dynamic, organic society where you have people inventing things, a lot of the stuff we're doing right now on the internet was invented by Israelis. They have an entrepreneurial spirit that that runs contrary to the left's agenda, which is to have you know collectivism and redistribution. The second reason they hate Israel is because it's Jewish. It is a God-based society. They believe in God, even the secular Israelis. And I'm very impressed by how the Israeli people have come together and have become more religious as a result of this atrocity on, on October 6th. And uh, I think that's a threat to the leftist agenda. It's a threat to the internationalist agenda, which has been decades, been centuries, trying to undermine belief in God. So those factors are what drive the inner core of the left. The other factor with young people is it's the same reason why 30% of young people now consider themselves to be non-binary. They're watching TikTok. They're watching, you know, various funny videos. They're influenced by people who are know how to reach them. It's trendy to be against Israel. You know, it's fashionable when you're going out, you know, trying to score a date, you know, going to a party, right? I mean, it's the cool thing to do. So you have a dumbed down generation. I don't I mean that with all due respect. Maybe it's the influence on me of Dr. Samuel Blumenfeld, the late Dr. Blumenfeld, who wrote many, many volumes on how the internationalists have dumbed down education in this country and how they've created the learning disorders by, by taking out phonics and other methods. You know, that's been going on for generations. And now you have young people who really, you know, they don't know how to think properly. They're, they're not, you know, well-read. They're not, uh, you know, they're not delving into philosophy or they don't understand the constitution. You know, it's all kind of this sort of, entertainment, whatever feels good. Whatever feels good is good. It's a, goes back to the ancient Greek sophists, you know, whatever, you know, the ultimate virtue of the Epicureans, I think, excuse me, whatever feels good is good. For some reason, as a public figure, the person that comes to mind is Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, he would wake up in the morning and say, and ask the pollsters, who am I today? And, you know, whatever felt, if, if it made him feel good, made him look good, he was, that's who he was. You know, there was no like depth. There was nothing be. There was no philosophy. There was no nothing beyond just the surface, the sensate. And I think that that's a reflection of our younger generation now, uh, which is a part and part of this irrational dislike of Israel. They have no idea what's going on with Gaza. They couldn't care less. It's just all this weird sort of irrational thing. And of course, behind the scenes, you've got major forces that do want to destroy Israel. Qatar, for example, is financing these massive billboards throughout Greater Boston right now, which are, you know, the pray for Gaza. Yeah, of course, pray for Gaza. Nobody wants to have innocent people killed. It's terrible. I mean, but the idea that Israel would be deliberately killing innocent people, and then I hear various commentators talk about Israel engaged in genocide. I think I heard uh, 
Talk to me, Michael Jones, say that on your show. The Israelis are engaging in genocide. Really? Why isn't he upset about the actual genocide going on in the Arab and Muslim world against Christians and against Catholic Christians? It's been going on for generations and it's intensifying. That is a genocide. If Israel is not, Israel is a very multi-ethnic society. I mean, you know, it's not committing genocide against Muslims. Muslims are very, are doing well in Israel. Some of the people on the Israeli Supreme Court are Muslim. Uh, you know, Muslims are involved in, in all aspects of Israeli life. I mean, it's probably one of the most tolerant societies in the world in that way. But they had this enemy on the border, namely Hamas, who was lobbing thousands of missiles into the country, building terror tunnels so they could go in and kill as many Israelis as possible, floating gas balloons over Israeli fields so they can burn their agriculture, and then eventually coming in through hang gliders so they could brutalize and rape and slaughter as many Israelis as possible. So what sane sovereign nation would put up with that? Can you imagine if that was Canada, you know, over the United States border? I mean, well, I live in Mexico. Yeah, imagine it was coming yeah, okay. down from Mexico. I actually live here in the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. Um, right. But go ahead and finish your thought. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just, I, no, yeah, I can imagine all. it. I mean, so, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you can't, it's not tolerable. And Israel handed Gaza over to the Palestinian Authority and hoped with, with very simple, ex, you know, with no expectations other than to have a peaceful border. That was all. They handed it over under Ariel Sharon um, and they, they helped the Palestinian Authority train their local security forces so they could retain, maintain order. Money was pouring in from all over the world, including the US taxpayers. They had every opportunity to create a sovereign Palestinian state there um, the Israelis stripped away the Jewish population. They, they ethnically cleansed it. And some of those Jews didn't want to leave either. They were taken out at gunpoint. And they had every opportunity, but they turned it into a launching pad to invade Israel. So that's not tolerable for any sovereign nation, let alone Israel. Now, you're right about Sharon made that decision unilaterally, basically, and he had enough clout where he could do whatever he wanted, basically, right. he was still around. And then he went into a comment and all this stuff. But, um, yeah. but yeah, I was watching it live on TV, and I remember watching it, and you're right, a lot of them didn't want to go. Uh, yeah. And they drug him out of there uh, on his orders. That's true. But it was also on his order and Condoleezza Rice and the Bush administration that they even had an election in Gaza in the first place. Uh, right. And then Hamas won the election. Uh, and then nice. they said, well, we don't respect the results of the election. Well, okay, well, first off, y'all were the ones who made them have an election in the first place uh, to try to give probably them... Probably a mistake. Yeah, yeah, probably a mistake. Well, they wanted to give the Palestinian Authority some credibility, right? Uh, and hey, mm -hmm. we'll set up this election. You guys will knock it down. Uh, and then we have another democracy here, right? And now we can work together. Right. And there is the theory yeah. that democracies don't start wars with each other and that this is just better for, you know, that's a theory that's out there. Uh, right. And so anyway, Hamas won, though. And, you know, there's several reasons for that. Maybe they're just, you know, feeling like that right for various reasons but also the palestinian authority is notoriously corrupt uh and hadn't really got that much done for the palestinian people really uh over the decades so maybe they were just tired of hearing it uh from them but hamas did win that election uh, i don't know if they'd win now or not um you know there's been they probably would they probably would though that's what i yeah, that's what probably. i suspect yeah um, yeah. so well that's what i was going to move on to uh the palestinians now without a doubt uh the attacks on october 7th uh, brutal and I you know I can't support that uh, and the things that Hamas did I'm not a Hamas supporter but um, what are they supposed to do right like you know I, I, I'm not supporting the attacks but if you're kind of living in a prison basically your whole life uh, where you don't have any I guess they have freedom of movement within Gaza but Israel controls the border um, around their territory and then Egypt controls this part and you know there's blockades and um, you know they're just living in a hellhole uh, with not much hope um, you know I, I don't know what what is your answer or thoughts on the on the Palestinian question right okay. uh, there's all these Palestinians here uh, and they've been arguably uh, subjugated for for decades without any real I don't know coherent plan here to 
kind of fix that. Um, now maybe it can't be fixed. That's, that's a definite thought out there too, but, um, it, are, are the attacks that we saw just an, an, an outgrowth of, of what's been going on to what's been happening to the Palestinians for decades? Well, 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 as I said, I mean, Gaza, however it happened, chose to engage in war against the state of Israel itself. Sure. They could have chosen peace. They could have turned that place into like Hong Kong if they'd wanted to. Uh, you know, my, as I say, this is beautiful beachfront property. I mean, if you see pictures of Gaza, Absolutely. it's not war. You know, this is something that money was pouring in from all over the world, but instead they just use it. I mean, this incredible tunnel system they built all for the purpose of kidnapping a couple of hundred Israelis. I mean, it's like, it's, you know, they, they could have used that, those resources to build a very successful society and they didn't do it. And there's no reason to assume that they're going to do it in the future. I mean, the Palestinians have been given opportunities going all the way back to the 1930s to have a sovereign state alongside Israel. And they've basically blown it every time. I mean, they just, we're not going to accept Israel. We're going to destroy Israel. And Israel's fought back and won. So I don't think that it's tenable at this point. Uh, I think that the Israeli state should offer citizenship. I know this is controversial to Very. Palestinian Arabs. Uh, and that that citizenship should involve a one-year period of, 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 of education over what Israel's about, uh, both politically and religiously. And at the end of that one year, if they pass the test, they then would take a loyalty oath and become Israeli citizens. That's, I, I think, the only way forward um, in, in terms of um, Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian people. Um, the Arabs have sovereignty galore. I mean, they're, they're sovereign all the way from Morocco to Iraq. You know, they've got Saudi Arabia. I mean, Israel is the only tiny Jewish state. And I think that Israel makes a better case for sovereignty in that country than the Palestinians make. I'm not discounting their, their desire for sovereignty there. I think that's real. I just don't think it's the stronger of the two cases. And uh, I would argue that, uh, you know, they should be given that option. Uh, maybe there could be local autonomy in Judea and Samaria and Gaza, but ultimately Israel has to maintain its sovereignty in that tiny country. Now, you know what? That's the first I've heard anybody putting that forward. You would get pushback from both sides uh, with that, yeah, and, I, and I'll examine that in a second. But what, first off, what do you do with the people who don't accept that? Who, who there probably there might be some who take that offer. Yeah. Um, what do you do? They should with, be expelled. To sit, they should to, either be expelled, or they should, if they want to make war against Israel, then Israel has to meet them on the field of battle. If they want to not accept citizenship but just live peacefully, that's fine too. But you know, the, the the citizenship should be offered, and I think that a lot of them, I think probably about a third of them would accept it at least. I think some probably would. Yeah. Um, but once okay. once the fear disappeared, and once they knew that they weren't going to be retaliated against, that you know, and that will require Israel winning militarily for that to happen. Now. Um... Yeah, I think I think some probably would. I don't know what the percentage would be, but I think it would be right. a, a sizable chunk. Um, I think so. Now, the worry and why I don't think that would fly with with the leaders there in, in Israel, especially particularly the the right wing ring ones, uh, right wing ones, which have to run the country, right? Um, is because uh, if you look at the statistics. Uh, there's already a, a lot of Arabs inside of Israel. Um, they're a minority, but they they typically have more children, uh, and there's worry about the changing nature, the changing composition of the demographics there in Israel. Uh, bringing in more Arabs uh, would change the change that even further. Uh, wh what's your is there any worry or any concern about that? Um, that they would add to the Arab population and change it from a Jewish state, uh, which is like in the Israeli constitution, I think, or charter or some, something like that, right? Like, is. This is a Jewish nation. This is a Jewish state. Um, yeah. Is there any concern about that, uh, that they would change? Yeah, there the... is concern about it. I think that the Arab population is not growing as quickly as people think. Um, and I think that the Jewish population is growing, especially the Orthodox community um, is growing rapidly. Even during this war, 
about 8,000 people, 8,000 Jews, including American Jews, have made what we call made Aliyah. They've immigrated to Israel. And I think that if Israel shows the kind of strength, both politically and morally, that they need to show, then Jews will continue to settle there. And uh, Palestinian Arabs will continue to also thrive there as Israelis and accepting Israel's mission, if you will. You know, I mean, I, I, I just, uh, maybe I'm being overly optimistic about that, but I think that, um, you know, it's really the only way forward. Now, um, okay, so I, that's the first time, I, I don't think I've heard anybody uh, say that, um, mm -hmm. you know, offer citizenship. I have heard yeah. people say that the two state, you know, that's kind of, you know, no, that's dead in the dead. water, and that, that's yeah. probably not going to work. And um, you know, I used to disagree with them. Now I don't know that I do. <laughs> that I do. Um, but okay, you mentioned it, it'll involve Israel winning mini militarily. Um, wh what just what does that entail uh, for them to win mi militarily? I mean, we're four months in uh, now. Um, what do yeah. they have to do? It's, uh, some of the hostages they want are dead by their own uh, admission. Um, what does it involve, I guess? Well, I mean, they have to finish the job in Gaza, and it's been a slow process because the Israelis, I know that some people may not like hearing this, but they're not going in with as heavy a fist as you think. They're going in carefully and putting their own lives at risk in order to find the people who are firing the missiles, find the Hamas militants, and not kill innocent people. It's a very difficult and complicated job given the fact that the Hamas militants are dressing in civilian clothes, blending into the population and hiding behind uh, people, you know, women and children. I mean, the Hamas leadership, they would take their weapons and their bombs home with them and have them in the basement of their homes, even though their children and families are upstairs because they knew that the Israelis aren't going to fire the missiles at those places. And the Israelis knew where they were, by the way. And yet they would not they didn't want to do that kind of a war. They tried to strategically find the very specific enemy, the people that are killing the Israelis, people who are firing missiles, and only take them out, not the collateral. And uh, I would argue that the Israeli military in that way, not perfectly, there are problems, but they do maintain a fairly good standard of, of, of morality and of uh, treatment and partially it's it's out of self-interest because yes. if you go in and you start killing innocent people it's only going to antagonize people in the future so it's a very difficult and very thorny situation but israel is doing it and the israeli people are, to, are united in wanting to see that through once that's done obviously the final threat is iran and i think that that's a threat to the entire region that's why you have the abraham accords and you have saudi arabia uh, developing informal relations with Israel because they all feel threatened by Iran. And uh, I think that once the Gaza problem is is ended, th there will be a, a, a movement to neutralize Iran, at least in terms of, of a threat. I don't I don't think I don't want to see a war with Iran. I don't I hope Iran is not invaded. I respect Iran's sovereignty. But if they're going to engage in these kinds of adventures where they're setting up proxy armies like Hamas and like Hezbollah and like the Houthis, then that has to be met by a combination of Israelis and Arab nations. Now, um, okay, so you're you're not wrong about Saudi Arabia. They're kind of behind the scenes. Um, they can't signal openly, but they're kind of on the same page as Israel in a lot of respects, and we're about to sign some things, perhaps, uh, before all this stuff happened, uh, to normalize relations and stuff like that. But they're already informally kind of have an alliance against Iran. Uh, and so, yeah, you're not wrong about that. Um, but as far as Hamas goes, again, I'm not a Hamas guy, but if you were trying to fight Israel with the resources a Palestinian territory would have like Gaza, um, you know, often I'll hear, well, you know, they did this and that. And a lot of it's f completely, I was about to use a bad word, completely messed up. I'll say I'm yeah. trying to work within FCC guidelines here. I don't always do that. Uh, nope. but it's really messed up. Uh, you know, some of the stuff Hamas did for sure. Uh, 
Uh, and, you know, it's messed up to take your bomb home with you while your family's there. I, I don't disagree with that. But can they really, f I mean, they can't really fight head up against the IDF, right? They have, they almost have to do, they don't have to do the raping and stuff like that. Uh, but they almost have to do like sneak attacks, like the hang gliders. They almost have to hide their bombs at their house. They almost have to do things like that to, to fight them. Now you might say, well, they don't have to fight them. That's true. That's um, <laughs> right. Is that what you're going to say? That's <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> anyway, if they go want ahead. to fight Israel, Israel's <laughs> going to fight back. I mean, it's just that simple. And that's what's happening now. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, they've engaged in a war of aggression against the state of Israel. And Israel's responded in kind. So I hope that they, uh, they finish the job. It's going to take a while. But I think they're almost there, God willing. And I hope that no more innocent people are killed well, you and know, that the hostages come back in safely. And this might be controversial amongst, amongst some people listening. I don't actually think that Israel typically, not that it hasn't happened ever, uh, but that they would intentionally, you know, all these, that they intentionally killed the 10,000, 50,000, whatever innocents that no, they say. they did not intentionally uh, kill anybody. But they still killed them, uh, right? It's like, a war. It's yeah. a war. Look, people were killed in Germany in World War II. I mean, it's... It's a very difficult war, and it's a very difficult enemy that's embedded into the population. I would only note that the figures that you hear coming out about the deaths in Gaza, those are figures that are coming out of Hamas. And we, all, we won't know the full story until it's over. I would note that a large percentage of those people are combatants, that they're counted amongst the numbers, and that's a military question. And also that Hamas itself, has fired very incompetently missiles that kill their own people and that they have killed you know there was recently a story that 30 30 palestinians were found in in you know black bags and they've been killed israel's being blamed for that not so fast you know let's just see were they seen as informants i mean the Pal the hamas has has no regard for the life of the people in gaza that's pretty clear and I think that after the fog of war, you know, dies down, we'll get to the actual numbers. Israel's not innocent completely, you know. As I said, I mean, it's a war and it's ugly. But what choice do they have? They can't have it, an enemy like that operating and killing Israelis on their border. They ha like any sane, sovereign state, they have to meet that enemy in the field of battle. Otherwise, they don't have a right to be a state. Because that's why we create sovereign states to protect the lives and the property of its citizens, and that's what Israel is doing. Now, let me ask you. And they have used ground troops uh, here and there, and they do have yeah. troops on the ground, but there hasn't been a full-scale invasion, uh, really, of Gaza. We'll just uh, you know rush them like that. Instead, they relied on air power and you know precise you know run in the here, run in there, take this area. Right. But they haven't just fully pushed in which arguably you you could save some lives if you didn't uh, bomb the way they bombed um do you think that that was a choice that they made to because it'd be more bloody on their end uh if they did a full-scale uh invasion and if so do you think that's a fair choice where they've exchanged not that they're doing it intentionally but you know there's going to be some innocents killed when you're dropping bombs like this uh in a densely populated area like gaza which is not that big for those who are watching it's, right. it's very small with like 90 miles or something if that uh and so what what do you think about their decision to to rely on um air power and targeted um run-ins with the idf rather than just full-scale invasion well well i think the key word there is targeted i mean they've tried to target specific targets that have been identified as uh missile launch sites tunnels and other military targets it's not that they get it right every time uh it's not that it's perfect but they've actually done a very brilliant job of of having people on the ground who then are able to communicate simultaneously with israel's navy and israel's air force to target specific sites when they see them coming up um and i think they've tried to be as precise as possible in terms of taking out these sites um, you can look at, for example, on uh, Twitter, the Israel, the IDF, the Israeli Defense uh, Twitter account, and they'll tell you what they did in the course of a day. 
you know, that they hit this target, they eliminated these specific terrorists, they destroyed this tunnel, they destroyed that missile launcher, and they used both Air Force, Navy, and Army to do it. So I think that they're trying to do the job carefully and slowly, and they're trying to get the right people to end this war. The question is, when will Hamas stop the war and get free passage out of Gaza, which they have certainly been offered? Um, it's it really and, and release the hostages. It's really come down to that. The only card they still have really is the hostages. Well, I can tell you, um, I don't see that happening because uh, were they going to get free passage to another Arab country who doesn't even really yeah. want them there? Though that's the problem, and they're going to lose all political influence, right? They get, well, they're going to be well. They're going to have to other friends. You know, it's it's their choice, and I hope that they do take that choice. You know, they've siphoned all they they got all this money. They siphoned it out of Gaza. You have the top three Hamas figures, each worth over two billion dollars, living in Qatar. And um, you know they'll they'll claim that somehow the the Gazans are are, are being set upon. Um, you know they, they they can find another way, or they can make peace with Israel. You know there there are options for them, but they're continuing to fight Israel, and Israel's going to respond on the field of battle like any country would do. To give them a ceasefire would be just giving them a chance to to uh, rebuild and to win, because every time there's been a ceasefire in Gaza. They just keep fighting and they just keep firing missiles and uh, only Israel ceases the fire. So that that obviously isn't going to work because it's not going to be mutual. It's not going to be both sides. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't see Hamas leaving Gaza uh, because if they go to another Arab country, I, I don't know if people understand this. Now, publicly, the Arab countries and their leaders, you know, the Palestinian people, and we love them and we totally back them and you know some of them even maybe back at moss they say they do or have sympathies towards the they really don't though uh in reality right, right? no they don't uh, want no one yeah. actually wants them but i mean yeah. i would know that when arafat was lost in uh, in beirut uh after the Lebanon war he was given safe passage to tunisia yes where he and his thugs and his entourage di you know disembarked and they went to tunisia and lived in exile yes so that can happen, and maybe that's that's a way to go. I don't know. Yeah, that can happen, and that did happen. Now, eventually, he yeah. made his way back. Uh, but yeah, they. Yeah, thank you, Yitzhak Rabin, but that's another yes. story. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a totally different. Uh, yeah, that's the whole yes, situation. That's a totally different uh, can of coffee there, uh, yeah. so to speak. Now, and I, and I won't keep you all night, but I figured maybe like 10 more minutes and we'll. No, why not take some calls? We'll I mean, I'd have to answer people and. Yeah, you know, I would. I don't have to pass through. I would love to take calls right now. You know what? Next time we get you on, I'll have that figured out where I could take some calls, uh, and that would be fantastic because I know some people would call in uh, right sure. now, and it's all on me uh, to. And I want to, you know, I'm an interviewer, right? I'm not in a adversarial necessarily, although I have my own views on this. Uh, of course, but uh, you know, I'm trying to push here, push there, and get your thoughts. It's not about um, attacking anybody or anything like that. I have my interview interviewer hat on. Uh, here, but we'll move on from the Gaza stuff. Um, I was talking to a a Mexican Mexican national a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. this person we were we were talking about. I don't know how it came up, but um, Gaza had come up, and you know we we're talking about it, and they didn't know that much about it, and you know I'm saying this and that, and they said, "Well, wait, wait a minute. What is the what's the difference between?" Uh, Jewish people and white people. Uh, and they said, well, they're just the same, right? Like they're white. Um, like, I don't, I don't even see a difference there. Uh, I, was kind of, <laughs> I was kind of shocked, honestly, because you don't hear that very much uh, in America necessarily. But um, then I thought about, um, you know, that's how um, a person who's brown skin may see it, right? Um, a person who's in a country like Mexico, but may not even make uh, a delineation there and it may just be these are white people doing this that and the other or I've even seen it uh, you know this is uh, the uh, Zionist project is white colonialism I've seen some people say that uh, right. too now how do you see uh, Jews in relation to to white people are they uh, a distinct um, race uh, are they yes. distinct um, people uh, or are they white 
Well, I mean, I think that American Jews have gone through great lengths to pass as white <laughs> and have become white in a sense, uh, as have other ethnic groups, because white people have been the predominant American group. So, you know, there is this desire to assimilate and to pass as white, but I think Jews are their own ethnic uh, entity, just like Italians are or French or Germans. Uh, you know, and it's not necessarily white. It's, uh, you know, if you go to Mexico, I mean, Mexican Jews are Mexicans, right? I mean, right, I think that doesn't Mexico now have a woman who's running for a prime president the leading of Mexico? leading and expected winner of the, of the presidential race in June. She just officially declared a no. few days ago, but it was known she was going to run. And she's, she's uh, as Mexican she's, as any Mexican. Claudia Scheinbaum, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, she's expected to win. Um, right. and I don't even know that she's Zionist, uh, actually, um, maybe not. She probably is maybe not. The point is that she's as Mexican as any Mexican, she's as Mexican as tacos, right? You know, so you have in America, you've got American Jews who are as American as apple pie. I mean, it's just, uh, we have a tendency to want to be part of, and to certain degrees assimilate into the, the, the nation where we live and yet at the same time maintain an identity and maintain a separate religious uh, body of work. And uh, that's just been part of the, the diaspora um, in terms of Judaism. I mean, Jews come from all ethnic backgrounds and all races. You know, you have black Jews in, uh, in Ethiopia who have immigrated to Israel to a large extent, Falashas, and uh, they're Asian. And, you know, Jews are all over the world and it is intermarriage which is probably why ethnically or racially they they have become similar to the host nations. But at the same time, they've maintained not only their identity, but I think a certain ethnic element. Well, I t told the person, <coughs> let's name them, I told the person that I was talking to these several weeks ago, uh, well, that first off, not every Jew <laughs> is white. Uh, even the ethnic right. uh, Jews, you know, some of them, and they're a little bit darker uh, than that. Right. Uh, and then, of course, you have the Ethiopians. Of course, they're darker. And some other people, you know, who adhere to right. Judaism. Um, but yeah, I was talking to the, to that person, but I, I was just surprised. Okay, but all right, with what you said there, is there such a thing as as being white, or if there is, what what do you see that like? What is the white race? Like, what is white? I think it's more of an idea. I mean, I think that the white, I mean, those those were designations that came in the in the late nineteenth century. Um, you know, kind of the the early anthropologists decided who was white <laughs> and who was, you know, they, they divided everybody up into races. A lot of that is just a, I think, a social construct. I mean, originally in this country, the only people that were thought of as white were English. You know, they didn't view Irish as white when they first emigrated to the United States. So a lot of that is more of a cultural thing. And in that sense, culturally speaking, you could say that American Jews are white because that's the majority in America. But ethnically, not so quickly. I mean, you know, ethnically Jews, I think we trace our ancestry back to the Middle East. Yeah, I don't know. It's a complicated uh, discussion. Um, it is. But um, I, was, I was just surprised because the person I was talking to, they just go, well, what's the difference? They're white. Like, right. what are you even talking about? It's just white people doing, doing things. Like, what? Are... <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Certainly, something somebody in chat probably wouldn't say that to me, right? Like I was like, "What, what?" Uh, and so we start having this discussion, and it, it made me think, though. Uh, and so I, I wanted to bring that up uh, while I had you on here. Uh, sure. Now, now your book, the anti-Semitic uh, imagination. Do you think uh, anti-Semitism? First off, how would you define it? Uh, and then, second off, do you think it's on the rise? Um, if you do, why? I think it's an agenda on, on the part of the establishment. I think that it is, if people woke up and realized that this was an agenda, they would try, they, they would realize that they, the Jews are friends of freedom as a, as a religion and as a people. I would particularly point to the Arab street, and I get into this in my book, that originally Arabs were pro-Israel. Right after World War I, they looked forward to the development of a Jewish Palestine to be sovereign and to be partners with all of the emerging Arab states. And uh, they admired Jewish uh, 
you know, energy and democracy and technology and, you know, kind of like a, a view that was, was, was more oriented toward the individual. And they wanted to emulate that. And I go into how that not only was in place, but how it was subverted by corrupt, you know, people who involved with secret societies like the Muslim Brotherhood and how the Nazis interfered with that. And then eventually the communist Soviets interfered with that. And they spread propaganda that was anti-Israel. If the Arab tree woke up and they saw how Israel is and how it's doing, they would want that for their own country. Rather than focus on Israel as an enemy, they would emulate Israel and develop states that are like Israel and inspired by Israel. You know, but yet they've they've gotten swept up in this weaponized anti-Semitism, and that's what it is, to the degree that they blame Israel for everything in their lives. I mean, it gets to the point of absurdity. I'll point to like in Tunisia, this was about 10 years ago now, there were sharks off the coast. They were biting people on the beach. And the Tunisians said, oh, this must be the Israelis, <laughs> right? And so an Israeli cartoonist drew a picture of sharks with yarmulkes. I mean, it gets to be that crazy that people, you know, it, it's almost you're, you're, you're diverting attention from your own lives, your own problems, and you're focusing on this external, the Jews, Israel's to blame. And it's a way for these regimes to distract attention away from their own corruption and their own authoritarianism. And it actually goes back to ancient times with idol worship. That's what idol worship was all about. That's why the Torah rails against it because the idol is a false god and it is run by the state and the state uses it to terrorize people or to convince them that you know they're in control somehow magically and i think that's what that's what modern anti-semitism is all about and it's not unique to jews either it can, you can target other people too i mean you could uh, we we saw i mean i get into why the holocaust is important to understand we we saw for example recently and I'm not going to go too far into this because I know you're on YouTube. No, no, I'm not on YouTube. No, you can. Oh, you're not. No, no, no. Okay. I'm, I'm not on YouTube. I'm just using Google Meet because that's just what I use. Um, oh, all right. No, so you can say whatever you want. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. We saw the demonization of people in 2001 who were not accepting the jab. Okay. That's right. Right. I, I never took it. I never took it. Yeah, we got Katie Couric said, "Oh, we'll have to put them in concentration camps." You saw an ugly campaign of. Uh, really vindictive attacks and people were being drummed out of the u.s military with dishonorable discharges unless they took this jab this experimental drug and that to me is folk the establishment focusing on a particular group of people that they wanted to demonize in the same way that the nazis focused on the jews to demonize and that can happen again that's something that we need to learn. And that's part of what this, so I, I bring that up only to note that it's not unique to Jews. Any group could be demonized that runs afoul of this establishment. And the reason Jews run afoul is because we believe in God, because we're individuals who are taking care of our own lives and our own families first. We believe in success. We believe in education, you know, and that is a threat to this establishment who wants a bunch of people who are lobotomized and cooperative and who are going to lie supine to their authority. You know, they don't want strong individuals who have self-interest. Karl Marx, I do a chapter on that. He developed political anti-Semitism. The Jew believes in money, he says, and the Jew believes in huckstering, which is another word for free trade. And a Jew is self-interest. And if we can annihilate Judaism, we'll get rid of all those things. That's an exposure of what the establishment is all about. And that's why Judaism itself as a faith should inspire people because it you, you can self-actualize and find your own agency under God. That's what the Jew is instructed to do. Now, I just got, oh, did, did you answer the part about, do you think it's on the rise, uh, anti-Semitism? Yeah. yeah, I, I think it, it is, is because I think the, you know, first of all, anytime Israel is at war, it goes on the rise and for some reason and israel is again it's defending itself it's defending the lives and the property of its people it doesn't need to apologize for that but the propagandists the international left all their various allies like we said one dollar propaganda zero zero on rumble that 
ways ask him about the tunnels those kooky jews and the tunnels um, and i think that it's again it's an establishment and gender as well now I, I do have a question here uh from the super chat and i'll ask you about that in a second but um if you have any more super chat questions send them in i'm going to figure out a way to get it back like the old days where we could have people call in uh with the guests because this would be great tonight i keep thinking once you said that i was like man that would be great wouldn't it uh if we could have people call in i'll i'm going to figure that out somehow um but uh, what do you say to people in the chat who maybe listen to this and they're like this guy like uh, clearly basically the the Jews are the establishment, or they're part of it, and a lot of this is what what's being pushed because they want it to be pushed. How do you, how do you convince somebody that the Jews aren't part of the establishment or not leading the establishment? I think that the, the Jews have been, as I said, sort of junior partners to this international establishment. And when I say the Jews, I don't mean as a people, and I don't mean most Jews. I mean these elite Jews who are very much part of this whole thing. Uh, they have now embedded themselves into this establishment, and particularly in recent decades. <clears throat> it didn't used to be the case, but um, it goes back to the, um, you know, the early or the medieval Europe. I think um, when you had Saint Augustine um, responding to genocide sent one dollar. Zero zero Jews, on Rumble. Said no, we have to ask him about why circumcision has right become very live, common in America. Right to worship unmolested. In, in Latin, it's called secut Judaeus non. Um, but they cannot hold positions of influence because they rejected Jesus and they rejected the divinity of of Jesus as, as God, and therefore they are subversive and they're corrupt. So we can't let them hold positions of influence. But the result of that is that. On the one hand, Jews should be grateful that we were not annihilated and that we were allowed to live in Europe and, and continue our civilization and our life. And I would argue, you know, lend a moral backbone to, to Europe as well. But also that we were restricted. We could not own land. We could not go into certain professions. Jews were banned from joining guilds. Jews were sometimes kicked around. They were pushed into ghettos, you know, and whatnot. But the Jew, because they were outside of European power, they were outside of the aristocracy, they had their own court system, they had their own sort of separate governance. The prince in these countries, the king, the potentate, would form an alliance with the local Jews because the Jews could do things that they couldn't do. The Jew could get involved with credit because Christians were not allowed to. They, they, they called it usury. Yes. The Jew could do some things, you know, in the case of Poland, for example, the Jews were allowed, you know, they ran these estates for the Polish aristocracy. Uh, they were tax collectors. They did some of the things that are not popular because they, first of all, they were restricted. Secondly, they were protected mostly by the Pope, but also by these kings. And they would thus get into these various professions and they would form a partnership with the Christian rulers. And that partnership has continued in a certain way to this day, in that you have Jews who are underlings in this international establishment and who are doing some of the things that they don't want to do and who are, you know, in with them. But but the agenda for the Jews, even back then, besides making a few bucks, no question about that, was to protect their community from persecution in exchange for their services. And that it didn't always work because you could have a new king come along after the old king died, and they would say, oh, we're the hell with the Jews, and they would kick them out. Uh, there's a good book about this by so a sociologist, Benjamin Ginsberg, called The Fatal Embrace. And it goes into explaining why the Jews, particularly from the diaspora times, have tended to um, ally themselves with authoritarian power because they need to feel protected. They need to, there's an insecurity of being a minority. They're the only minority that really survived in Europe. And, and so you have a psychology of seeking uh, earthly power. And that, that can translate but sometimes into some rather bad things. I hope that the Jewish people get over that. It's not gonna happen overnight, but I think the way to, um, reasserting the jewish covenant is 
belief in God and prayer and love and belief in the right of you know loyalty to your your respective country but also uh Israel as a, as a dynamic society that is a land where the Jews are in the majority and where they can enjoy the same sovereignty that all people should enjoy all right, now uh, I have a couple of uh, super chat questions here. If you have any more, pile them in, and you can still support after too. Of course, some people like to send in songs and stuff like that. That wouldn't really yeah. fit right now, but uh, if you have any questions, those would fit. Um, Liquid Sucralos uh, says, "Ask him about the tunnels." I presume he's talking about the tunnels, not in Gaza, but the ones they found in New York. Uh, Underneath the yeah, tunnels? Yeah, yeah. And there's been a lot of yeah. There's been a lot written about that. That yeah. maybe there was. We covered it. I don't really know. I can't say there was any. I don't know. I think that is or anything like there's that. There's a lot of conspiracy there theories. There are some conspiracy. There are conspiracy yeah. theories you might I, say. Yeah. I think that's a big nothing burger. I don't think that. I think that they basically built those tunnels as a way to get to to and from the mikvah on Shabbos, and you know they've got there's nothing. You know they, they what they think that Jews are killing babies and all that kind of crap. I mean no, that's 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 craziness. All right now, um, then he says, okay now. This might be more of a, he said, ask him about why circumcision has become very common in America. Although it's, it's term hasn't fully turned back around, but if you look at the rates, it has come down a little bit uh, over the last right. 10, 20 years where people decided uh, not to circumcise their children. I, for the record, not to give you too much information, I'm not uh, circumcising. When I was born in 1985, that was very rare, uh, <laughs> right? Um, so um, I, my I, I don't really know the to, answer. But, but do you I, think I there's some the type of conspiracy that, there or some type no, of... No, I mean, uh, look, it's, it's in the Torah that this is what God commanded Abraham to do. And I don't know why God commanded him, but I believe in the Torah. And that's what the Torah says. And that's what Jews have done for themselves. They're not asking non-Jews to do it. I mean, it's just a Jewish thing. And uh, yeah, it's one of those things that's it's kind of grandfathered in. It's supposed to be a, a, a sign on the flesh that you are a follower and a fearer of God, I suppose. I don't know a lot about it, but that's what we do. It's what we've been doing for 4,000 years. Uh, Non-Jews are not commanded to do it. Why are they doing it now? I don't know. I mean, I maybe there's some medical reasons for it. I don't know. They say that. They do have some justifications for it. I Right. I mean, if you're Jewish, I see why you're circumcised. Um, you know, there's it's, reasons. It's kind uh, of a but thing. <laughs> other than that, I don't see... I'm I'm kind of anti-circumcision, to be honest with you. I, I don't think that that's now. If you're Jewish, you know it's part part of your culture, whatever. And also Muslim, I, by you know, the way, I think what, what Muslims, Muslims are circumcised too. I think, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is kind of wild to me, but I you know I didn't know that Look, until it is, maybe it five, is ten years ago, thing, and then I was like, oh, they're circumcised too. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, they I, mean, are. I find it to be weird, but that's what the Torah says. That's what we've been doing for since the time of Abraham, and that's what we do. It's it's one of those things that it's in the Torah. There's a lot of things that are inexplicable, but that's, you know, the kosher laws are not always something that's necessarily logical. Uh, a lot of those are rituals that we don't know why God commanded it, but there's a matter, it's a matter of faith. And it's harmless, it's not hurting anyone. You know, it's, it's, a, it, it's more of a, a separation, I think, of the Jewish people from the rest of the nations. That might be part of it. Yeah, it could be part of it. I don't know. I might argue with you that it's harmless because you can lose some sensitivity. Or, but, I suppose. I mean, but, yeah. Um, it hasn't been a big problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, all right. Now, I'm looking down through chat, um, and you mentioned, yeah, um, I, I was thinking that, too. Maybe you having a discussion with uh, E. Michael Jones. Uh, since you specifically mentioned him earlier, I saw somebody mention that. Are you interested in having any, any discussions with other people, other guests yes. that we have on the show? Yeah, because I yeah, think that I am. I did a whole series with uh, Dr. Jones, and I admire his uh, his intellect, and I admire his work immensely. It had a huge effect on me. I just think that on this one issue, he's way off, way off the deep end, and I've argued with him on it. Um, I'm open to having him back, but we, I don't think we're in great terms right now. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, Especially since the October sixth event, um, we we've had some exchanges that are, you know, not friendly. 
Well, we've had unfriendly exchanges on here before too. I don't know if he would still. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind that I necessarily. Mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm certainly open to. If he's open to it. I, yeah, you know, I'm not. It doesn't necessarily have to be friendly. It could be, but no. uh, uh, <laughs> it might be better for me if it was unfriendly uh, uh, in terms of entertainment. Um, but uh, who all else have you talked to um, as far as people who might come on this show? Adam Green was mentioned too, as well. Some other I've, people. I've, had, I've, I've had Adam Green. I've talked to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Barrett. Um, you know, maybe if you want to set up a show like yeah. that, I'd be happy. Yeah, I'm going to look into that. It. Yeah, I would I'd definitely love it. Now, I don't know if you know, sure. you said you talked to Adam Green. Now, his theory is um, basically that um, Christianity is just like a stalking horse. For, right, for Jews, and that they. Well, he's annoyed. He's him. annoyed at me because I told him that I believe in the Bible, in the Torah, and he thinks that's insane. But um, I'd be willing to have. I mean, he's he's got a lot of information, and uh, he's bright. You know, I'd have, I'd talk to him. A liquor sucralose uh, in the super chat says, "Ask him if he hangs with unruly Shmuley." I, I guess he's talking about <laughs> Rabbi. Um, what's his name? Shmuley Beopet. Yeah, I forgot his full name, but Shmuley, and he had just had yeah. a debate with. Um, Norm Finkelstein, which I haven't seen right. yet, but uh, I heard about it. Maybe we'll watch some of that later. But um, what do you think about Shmuley? I, I'm not a close follower. I mean, I, I think he's okay. He seems to be, wasn't he the rabbi? He was Michael Jackson's yes, rabbi. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Yeah, yes. yeah he was Michael And as far as Finkelstein goes, I mean, I, I think he's really out to lunch. I mean, with due respect, I mean, he's, uh, I saw him talk about indigenous people. He's into that whole thing. And, um, to me, that's that's not that, that's like a Nazi thing. I mean, this idea of you know people have indigenous rights to a master land. I mean, that's 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 crazy stuff. I think. Um, yeah, and well, I, I won't get into my thoughts, but he's been everywhere since the since the Gaza yeah. thing started. Um, I guess just just doubling back around, I'll let you promote your stuff uh, here in just a minute at the end. Um, how do you see the the Gaza thing going? When do you think it's going to end? Um, will they actually take out Hamas? Which I yeah. have my doubts, but go ahead. No, they will take out. At least they'll take it out of Gaza. They, you know, they, maybe they can set up shop in um, Singapore or something, but they're not going to be in Gaza. That's not going to happen. The Israeli people are very united about that, and after everything they've been through with Hamas in Gaza, it's just not going to continue like that. And I don't know how long it's going to take. It could take of some Israeli military people. I was listening to uh, Jonathan Conricus, who is the spokesman for the for the IDF, and he said that it could take up to a year before they completely get rid of Hamas. But they're going to do the job and they're going to finish it, I believe. And I think the Israeli people, all Israeli people, are united in wanting that, and they'll get that. I hope it happens sooner than later. Now we talk mostly about your new book here today. Um, before I let you plug all your stuff, give us a book um, or an idea that's that's been outside of the stuff we talked about today uh, that you've written about that may be of interest to some people or may not, but it'll just give you a chance to talk. Well, about well it. I wrote I wrote a book about the um, what I call a false flag operation, that being the um, the January sixth um, quote unquote insurrection yeah i agree with you there. um and i talked about I'd, i've written a book about the um the 2020 election i've been in i've been on that one from day one and i, I continue to be on that and uh th that to me is the root of a lot of the problems we're having in this country right now yeah i don't disagree with you there um well now you made me think how do you see the election going god forbid it's not the so-called jfk solution I think Donald you know Trump what? Is going to be elected. It's so wild that you mentioned that because I just got back yesterday from a five day sabbatical, and one of the last conversations, and somebody in chat had mentioned this, and I, you know, the JFK solution. That might be Jesus. You know, yeah. I, I hadn't even thought about it, but a lot of Democrats don't want Biden to run. A lot of people don't want him to run. He doesn't seem to be heeding the call to to step aside. Uh, That's and then true. and then I started saying, well, you know, this would be the perfect opportunity for if. If those types of things happen, I'm not saying, uh, but um, uh, perfect opportunity opportunity for some type of 
mass casualty event or some type of just huge That's catastrophe. Good, yeah. Yeah, just some type so, of huge. These are very dangerous times. Yeah, yeah. I, election. Well, that's what I was, it's, I was saying. It's an ugly thing to think about, but yes, I mean, who knows? Right, what but they might but I start so I start talking along those lines, right? Like you know, yeah. wow, wouldn't that maybe that would give them some kind of boost, or maybe that would you know, what if this you know all of a sudden mysteriously the stadium gets blown up, right, or, or something like that? Um, yeah. And then somebody in the chat goes, or. You know something, and I don't want that to happen. I'm not encouraging. Maybe it is a new pandemic, right? I mean, pandemic, or maybe something happens to Biden himself, right? Uh, right. And well, Biden better be careful. <laughs> that's what I said. I mean, <laughs> like I would have a food taster right now if I was Biden. I, w- I would have. I yeah, would, I know, think so. Yeah, like it's it's getting to that level. But um, it's getting a little late, I think, in the game. Yeah, I do too. For them to try to replace him, I think they are going to probably try to put Donald Trump in jail, and they may get away with it. Uh, you know, the, this last decision in New York State is so horrible that the governor of New York actually had to go on television and say to uh, developers and real estate owners, don't worry, we're not going to investigate you. We're not going to prosecute you. It was only Trump, no one else. So just stay calm and don't leave. It was so beyond constitutional and so egregious that he would be prosecuted for something that is normal practice for business. When you sell a property, you list it at a higher price, at the highest possible price and see what, how the market bears. And when, you, when it comes to taxation, you wanna reduce the assessed value so that you pay less taxes. That's how business is done. That's nothing new, everyone does that. I mean, if you look at Zillow, they list properties that are a lot higher than what they actually eventually get for those properties are they committing a crime i mean this is like to have that be criminalized just because it's trump and to have a radical attorney general run for run for that office saying i'm going to get trump and every member of his family and is anyone's ever been done business with him it's just it's it's un-american and it's scary it's 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 a a complete perversion of our system of jurisprudence in this country. And I think that they probably overstepped themselves this time with that crazy ruling against him. And they did $650 million. That's insane. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, and they don't get it still, but they're going to get, they're going to do, who knows what they're going to do next. It's ugly. Something has to happen though, because um, either they're going to have to replace Biden uh, and I guess technically they could go, go all the way to the convention uh, and replace him there, which would they maybe could. give them, you know, maximum impact if they were to replace him, right? Because yeah, he'd be who? live on national TV. Well, that's the uh, question. You know, I I've mean, heard Newsom speculated. Down. I've heard Two Michelle Obama. Away. Michelle Obama, perhaps. I saw oh, an article God. in the Daily Mail the other day. Yeah, I don't- I, I don't know. It's getting to be <laughs> too late in the game, and it's also getting to be there's too many – you know, yeah, could that technically they can do whatever they want? I keep telling people this, but the, they're not bound by the primaries and the caucuses yeah. and all this shit. Excuse me, all this stuff. They the parties control who the nominee is, and if they just take a separate vote of the committee and say, "Well, we change the rules," or you know, this and that, and there's already yeah. a rule where you know on the second ballot and all this and that. Like, there's all kinds of ways they don't oh, have yeah. to. Oh, honor they that. Do it. Yeah, so it could still happen, but. It's unprecedented, uh, and you know I would just be in shock, uh, really, if that happened. But they could uh, still they could, do something and, like that. And also, I think that any attempt to paper the house with ballots and that kind of thing, I think too many Americans are now aware of that, and um, I don't think they can get away with it this time. Well, so then, I don't know. I, I go back and forth. At first, I thought they're putting Trump in jail for sure, and then the longer it went, now you know I was like, well, he's running so well and he's leading in most now he's leading in almost every single poll he is including and, nationally yeah yes in the harris poll even that's not rasmus that's oh, yeah. not you know these are Nine like points. yes yeah, it's and it's like okay well and this is february it's starting to get really late in the game and it is. you know I, at first i thought they're going to put him in jail but that's before he started running so strong and he just decimated the gop field and then i said well there's no way they can put him in jail that that would be crazy no, it no, would cause social unrest well, now I'm I starting mean, to think look, you might be right. They Maybe they will actually put him in jail because that might be the only way to stop him. That's right. I mean, look, at this is what they do in third world countries. Look what they did to Navalny, right? He was the main opponent of Putin, and they put him in jail. And, of course, look what happened. 
I mean, last summer in Cambodia, they the opposition party candidate was winning, and they they put him under house arrest and they stripped his name off the ballot. So well, these things happen, now, but they're not supposed to happen. And not America, to happen uh, here, but but to stop Trump. Look, most people have no idea why they they hate Trump. I think it's a massive psychological manipulation that has been coordinated. Um, this is something that I've gotten into in some of my books. Probably too big a subject to get into now. But the people in the know who do want who know why they hate Trump hate Trump because a simple reason. And I'll just say it flat: he is putting the interests of America first. He's putting the interests of his own country before those of all other countries and all other considerations, which, by the way, is what Israel does. And um, that is anathema to this international establishment that goes back generations and that seeks to turn the United States into a province of the world. Um, and this is what the battle is, I think, behind the scenes. Trump is waking up the American people to our own individual agency, and he's waking us up to the true nature of our, our system, which is that the individual derives his rights from God and not from the state. That, uh, I mean, Jefferson laid it out in the Declaration of Independence. We're endowed by the creator, God, not the state, with rights, inalienable rights. And I think that that's something that they've been trying to undo for generations. And Trump threatens it by his simple stand, by his simple articulation as a businessman and as an American. And Trump is putting a lot on the line. I mean, he doesn't need to do this. He's had a charmed life, right? He's got a great family. He's rich. He's famous. He doesn't need this. I think that, in my opinion, people may think this is naive, but I think that Trump, like some people, others, as he's older and as he's re reaching the end of his life, he wants to do something to give something back to his country that's been so good to him. He wants to leave a legacy of really making a positive change in society. So he's leading this movement. Now, while he's certainly far from perfect, who else is out there that can do this? It's incredible. I mean, it's a unique situation, a unique man. I mean, this this sort of figure comes along once in a generation, once in every multiple generations. You know what I think? I think I think he may feel that way now. Yeah, I agree uh, that he's trying to. He knows what it is now. This is about the history books now. Uh, this is about um, what are they going to say? I have to win this, you know, and I have to put some stuff on the record, right? You know, as far as uh, real achievement and defeating uh, my enemies and making America better, greater again, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. I, I, do, I do actually think that that's how he's thinking. And to stay out of jail, to be quite frank. Um, I, I think right. that's probably part of it too, although they may end up put, they may put him in jail anyway. Um, but Maybe he'll win from jail. Right, which would be amazing, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think that he didn't expect to win uh, that first one. Uh, if you look at his oh, face, I, I think you, really? really? I don't know, man. Yeah. Look at him on I've election heard, night. I've heard that. I, think, I don't think I, he thought I, was I, I, think he, I think that it was, it was shocking to a lot of people, but no, no, I think that Trump, you know, you have to understand how Trump thinks. Read the book, The Art of the Deal. Now, I know that he didn't personally write every word of it, but he had a lot to do with it. I read it probably maybe 20 years ago, and it left a big impact on me. I've been following Trump for a long time. And, you know, he doesn't, he plays to win. I mean, he expected to win and, you know, he, he and he, uh, he got what he expected. And I think he'll win again, if, if assuming, although, you know, again, don't underestimate what he's up against. It is determined. So, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I go back and forth on, whether or not I think they're going to put him in jail for the last no, few months, right. I'm saying no, they won't. Surely they won't, right? They can't put the leading candidate for president no, they can. in jail. They can. they can, and they probably will. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's yeah. That's just uh, they don't give a damn if they have to rip the whole country apart. Well, then I start saying, well, they'll stay the decision until after the the election. Uh, but now it's like, well, he's going to oh, win the election if he's out for sure, right? Like they. <laughs> You know, the first thing he'll do is issue a full unconditional pardon to himself. Right. And walk right out of jail. <laughs> that's um, right. And that's, by the way, completely constitutional. That's yes. uh, in, yes. you know, a president can do that. Certainly. Um, 
I don't know. We're in for a very exciting year, uh, I'll say. Just like I said the other night, hopefully it doesn't get too exciting. Uh, right. Yeah. That's, uh, hopefully it just stays in a certain level and doesn't get too exciting because those are not the type of years uh, that you want to see. But I really appreciate you taking so much time with us. And I went a little bit long because uh, I, I enjoyed talking to you. And I'll try to figure out appreciate the caller situation for next time. And I'll try to figure out a discussion uh, situation. Happy with to a, do it. With Happy to do it. Here. Do you want to host some debates? Yes, I'd love them. I love doing that. I've done that many oh, yeah. times. Yes, uh, and I would love to do it again. Uh, and I'm getting back uh, to work here, and I think that would be great if we could set you up with somebody. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Charles Moskowitz, thank you, uh, here on the Killstream. Tell people where they can find you and where they can find your books and, and plug some thank of your you. stuff here at the end, too. Well, my books are all available at Amazon Books and at Barnes & Noble Books online. Just put in my name in the server, Charles Moskowitz. And up it comes, Mos like Moscow with a wits. Right. It, me it means son of Moses, by the way. And um, my show is uh, Charles Moskowitz Live. It's uh, mostly on Rumble, but I'm on a bunch of other live streams. And and I do it, uh, I, I do two or three a week on average. Very cool. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, Ethan. All right, you have a good one. Charles Moskowitz here live on the Kill Stream, making his debut. Great time talking to him, actually. Of course, we disagree on, on some of that stuff, of course, but it wasn't. Thank you for watching this clip by Colonel J. This is the King of Bold here. Remember to like and subscribe. Juice.